Thank you very much for coming. We are really happy to have a very special guest here today. Yeah. This is... Just wish you a great time. Thanks, Michael. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, is, is that microphone for the audience later on? Maybe, yeah. I'll Maybe? Take it along yeah, yeah. Perfect, 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 perfect. Um, yes, welcome. Um, today, we're going to listen to some music, and uh, we're all going to listen to that over the wonderful uh, mixing console uh, made by Michael Zell and, uh, of course, Mark Alestos. When I found out uh, about the story, about this mixing desk, I got really excited. I usually tend to, at this point, hate equipment a little bit <laughs> because it's always uh, giving you a hard time. It's always trouble. You always need to extend something. You always need to change a part. Or you, you're just not really happy with, with what's going on. Um, and, and I read about this mixing desk. And of course, I'm a huge fan of... Uh, uh, Mark's work and uh, even when I heard that he was involved in making a mixing desk I was already excited and sold when I learned about what Michael's background is working with some of my most favorite engineers and artists and all music history it, it all sounded too good to be true and now um, finally or not finally but for a while I own a desk and I use it in my live setup and I thought it was a great um, opportunity uh, to show you some live recordings I've done um, over that board because the mixing desk is right in the center of my live setup. For those uh, of you who never have seen a live concert or don't know who I am, that's, uh, for those I explain a little bit, I, I use really a lot of analog equipment on stage, about four Junos, six bass echoes, a Mellotron, uh, acoustic instruments like a harmonium, a glass harmonica, which is rotating glass bowls, which you can play with your wet hands. There is a piano and a 808 drum machine, syncussion um, drum machine, and uh, some samples I made by myself, which I run over a little laptop like uh, things I record in the studio and can um, work over MIDI. At the heart of the whole thing is Cubase as a mid MIDI engine, which fires off various MIDI signals, SysX signals, and, and start, stop, and CV, and all the gates I need uh, to, to synchronize all the set. Uh, at the core was the idea that I wanted to be very flexible, and, and I wanted to shape the music um, as if I would improvise on the piano because my background is classical and so I, I come from the piano and I, I always love that you would be able to go in a direction you would never expect and when I started to like electronic music I always had a problem performing live because I always felt like I would do something in the studio and then basically just play what I've done in the studio live and it didn't really feel like a live concert so I, I um, I worked with some engineers on some MIDI matrices I, I use so I can, for example, play eight MIDI, mid, MIDI tracks which have different content and I have switches so I can direct certain MIDI signals on certain instruments like a really um, life-friendly MIDI matrix where I can just get really lost and, 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 and things happen which I would never expect. And so. Um, the exciting thing about what, I, what we're going to hear now is also that this is just falling out from, from the Mich the, the Zell desk, the AM1, where there's a master out, and I just record that in every show. And um, I didn't do any processing, no compression, no nothing. And I just thought it would be great to listen to something which is not really mastered or mixed or produced, but just like a raw kind of life cut. I, I'm super nervous because usually when I hear that I, I can do something, now I have to just sit there and, listen <laughs> and, and, and go through that. Um, the first track is rather meditative 
It's, uh, oh, I think I don't know the password. I, <laughs> I need, I need Mark. <laughs> um, the first track starts with an improvisation solo on a, on a mini MOOC. It's an old one, which I modified so it can do a little bit more modulation. Um, and, and after a couple minutes, it, there's a transition and you hear the different sound to an instrument which I now have in a studio in Funkhaus where I work in, in, in the Funkhaus studios here in the Leperstraße. Um, we got donated from the Technik Museum Berlin with their kind permission, the Supercord, which is a fantastic synthesizer from the 60s, developed here in East Germany. And there's only a limited number, I think there's three in total. And, and right now there's one there. It's a 200 kilogram synthesizer, a beast full of tubes, Germanian transistors, filters. It is just insane. It's like a whole broadcasting studio quality, all online level. It's just quality, quality, quality. And I, I, I can um, recommend that thing. They're just, just on the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is it possible to close the door? Because it's so delicate, quiet. <laughs> Not really. <laughs>
interesting, but the um, super chord we heard last is so interesting because they wanted to develop further the Troutonium, um, built by Trautheim, Oskar Sala was popularly playing it in Berlin. Um, Hitchcock um, made used the instrument in one of his uh, movies, uh, Die Vögel, The Birds, and um, the idea was to basically bring the Troutonium, which was a completely tube-based synthesizer, into a more or less transistor world and to replace the complicated ribbon controller keyboard with a real firm keyboard, which maybe wasn't a really good decision because the uh, Troutonium still remains incredible. Uh, it can also really sound beautiful, while the super chord can basically mostly sound pretty nasty. <laughs> and it was also probably therefore not very popular. And, and whoever was in political charge in that time over the money being spent in, on these projects didn't want to continue. Um, mainly uh, Russian leadership didn't want to continue. I think uh, Khrushchev was quoted with, this is uh, music for um, the electric chair. <laughs> and, 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 and so our first experimentation was really discontinued. And that instrument is kind of the peak of yeah, uh, communist um, synthesizer building when it comes to new innovative ideas. Uh, later on, obviously, in Russia, they copied a lot of the, of the uh, models which were made in the West and Japan and so on. But the, the, the core is this keyboard, which is chromatic, so you can play one main oscillator. And then there is subdividers for that one oscillator. You have four group of dividers where you can uh, get sub um, frequencies, which you can mix then, like on a mixing desk, into bigger s sounds, and 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 these frequency dividing steps are interesting because they are like overtone steps, but inverted into the other direction. So they 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 call it subtones. So you get some fifths and so on, but you get also some really weird intervals. You can mix it to each other. So you have the chromatic sound system. You have a sub sub-tone um, sound system and then they implemented another keyboard which which I play with my right hand which makes these ki ki ku 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 filter sounds um, which is called a, a mel filter I don't really know what mel stands for but the mel filter was another genius invention it kind of like resembles the, the frequency steps of uh, flageolet uh, overtone um, from a guitar. Not exactly, but something like that. And so that is another really weird sound system. So you have three different sound concepts in one instrument, and then by crossing all these, you get really incredible new sounds. And uh, unfortunately, that instrument wasn't really, there was not really recorded, any recorded material. There was never really anything <coughs> being done with that. And so I'm quite happy to be able to work a little bit with that. I want to not talk too much and give time for you to um, ask any questions, really, um, because I didn't really prepare anything. <laughs> <laughs> so about the about the, the signal path, what what are we we just hear stereo left right out from the studio or what? Yeah. Into the desk and then. Yeah, exactly. We have a stereo channel open now with, with just the stereo signal going in, and that is a recording from my live concerts. Yeah. Uh, what we just heard was one part was played in Utrecht two days ago, and uh, the Supercord <laughs> part was played in March in Funkhaus, where I play concerts in the big room because we cannot travel with a Supercord, it's too delicate, but we can play it in Funkhaus. And so I recorded that from the live concerts. And the great thing is I have something like this size of a Michael Zähl desk on stage where all my instruments go into mono channels and stereo channels. And I just, what we heard is basically the master out of that thing. And, and I would just want to demonstrate the clearness, the crispness, the so volume, you use the, the, the desk, warmth. You the use the desk as an instrument or as, as an additional instrument in terms of also 
live use, uh, changing uh, Yeah, unfortunately I can't show a video, otherwise I would have shown you how it looks, but um, it's exactly like that. It's pretty much what I learned from people like Mark or the genius dub producers from Jamaica. They, they have some channels with uh, the reverbs and and then and you 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 um, have so many aux channels here. You have six aux channels. You can do complicated things with. And um, I really think it's an instrument. Without it, I would be doomed at this well, point. A lot of the, these guys um, I know from the from the studio in Netherlands. They use old um, gear. For, oh, sorry. They use old old gear from you know uh, this, the fifties and so on. You know pure. Sign tone generators, etc., and then they they sort of make through the mixing uh, desk uh, they they assemble uh, certain timbres, uh, you know, using it act, act, as an addition to the whole uh, sound generation of it. Yeah. Yeah, that is that, that is. that is not the hundred percent what you do. Mm, I'm a little bit more, a little bit less consequent because it's still a live concert. I and mean, if I would stand there with eight, sixteen sinus generators and need to tune them, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> it would be a little bit hard. Um, I love the Juno sixty, for example, because it is very versatile and tuning stable. Then I have a mini MOOC on stage, which is the opposite. It's, I tune it constantly, and it, it, it is so frustrating to play it live. And uh, and then I have a SH2 uh, for bass sounds. Uh, has a wonderful impulse on the envelope, and it's underrated beast. And it sounds very good, like a modular to me. And um, the for the for Junos do a lot of work. The Mellotron is important. I play one trackway basically how all the things together which is the little bit loud one but after that our ears will be bleeding like i said nothing of that is mixed it just it just honestly i love to hear things which are not mixed because i feel like when thing, things come back from the mastering they often lose a little bit of that life work and edge, progress vibe yeah. edge it had when you were just finding the idea mm. and so i really get excited about like listening that's, that's to this moment. this that's moment, yeah. <laughs> that moment yeah. but but yeah honestly um it is like an instrument for me because i use the eqs a lot i use um the auxiliary and a lot of people have a good digital workflow which i absolutely understand and i i think it's great i i have to work um analog live and in the studio because what I'm addicted to is um, for example if I have a delay I, I make the feedback over the aux <coughs> um, because then I can insert an EQ and 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 and, and, and tweak and, and, and then and I, I feed the, the reverb into itself until it's long enough for me and, and and I parallel do things and and, 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 and I, I don't even use the CV channels which really turn the whole thing into an instrument um, if it wasn't enough with the normal channels because then you can route CV channels and generate movements in the mix uh, according to your outboard equipment and you can insert basically your whole modular setup uh, and and do do things to your mix and um, the concept of it is just great, the layout is great, and um, for me, I, I, I work so much faster because I do dip, 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 and it sounds great, and I don't even know what I've done, and you know, and then, then I, I do it. What do you send to the front of house if you do all the mixing on stage? Sorry. Um, Sorry. Ah, yeah. Uh, the question was uh, what do you send to front of house? That's a good question because um, honestly, I made experience that from the like the recording we heard from the master, it sounds really just fantastic, uh, the summing or whatever you would, might call it. But uh, for the live, I have an engineer who works on a digital desk um, and gets basically the direct outs. So he works with almost 32 channels and also implements the acoustic microphones. He also needs to mute the microphones when I move to another instrument so we don't get feedback so he really has to help me with a lot of stuff but um, we kind of do the mix together so to say yeah
did you have to practice with your Funk House engineer, rehearse with him? We rehearsed together on Funk House, like before we started tour, we set everything up as if in a live, live setup, and then of course I have to explain uh, what the music is like and what to do when. And uh, yeah, sometimes I get all, all the cues, but my front of house <laughs> doesn't, and sometimes the other way around, so it, it rarely falls into place perfectly, but this is what I enjoy. Like I said in the beginning, I come from a from piano and making music with real instruments, and for me the most exciting thing is if things can go wrong live. That's really nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, so, um, if you are, yeah, if you're starting with all this gear around you and you s decide you want to improvise, uh, then how is it like? Can you take me through the process of what is in your head happening? Like, okay, I have all these choices. I know what I'm gonna play next. So, how how do you want to make that bridge from the silence to your first piece? Yeah, for me the whole concert is basically like a, mm, like I, I consider all of it as one experience from the moment I go on stage, how long does it take to say hello, the moment how much silence do I leave before I actually play the first note. Um, I, I, I also leave six or seven seconds of silence before I start an album because for me the show already starts before the music is audible and so for me I, the show really ends when I'm not seen on stage anymore, but even the last goodbye is a rhythmical musical performance because all has a flow. And I can't describe it, it's like a bridge. For me, when I make a song, half is structure and, and the other half is maybe something you might call decoration or, or something crazy. You, know, you can build a crazy bridge, you can build a normal bridge, but the bridge needs to not collapse. And so, so for me, making music is almost like a, it's a duty to, to the consequences of static, so to say, you know, like certain music is just not music if you don't respect certain things. No. And, 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 and so you, I always think of that first. And if, if the, the static of the song is not there, I need to fight for it to be there. And if it's there, I can fly or I can walk on the bridge, so to say, you know, then I can really like, oh, I'm, I'm free to do now other things. And, and uh, yeah, that's a constant, uh, constant worry. So I change every night a couple of things. When I feel like things now, I do the same tricks for two or three nights. I try to do other things and to stay uh, actively half lost in the music. I, you need life, I think, a couple of cues where you can rely on this is working. This is what the people like here. But if you if you feel like you have them in, in one moment or because you've done something they liked, then I know, okay, now I can uh, risk something. Yeah. You know? mm. and, and, and that, uh, I, I try to never never lose that and, and just completely do other things. And, and also surprise my team because there's a front of house, there's a light engineer, <laughs> there's people backstage and if they know like, okay, he's doing the same announcement and the same thing every night, they also get yeah. tired. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I pass it over. Oh yeah, here we go. Here, my friend. Yeah. Watch the speaker. Of course. Uh, hello. <laughs> nice. Uh, hi, Niels. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And um, really great piece, by the way, that you just uh, just showed. Um, I understood that you uh, used to play the piano as well, and uh, you also have some uh, classical uh, music background. Uh, I was trained as a classical composer, and I'm kind of switching to the, the more electronic music now. I was just wondering, like, how did you kind of walk that path, and and specifically, like, um, like when like when you said when you play the piano, you you press a note and you you have like a tone, and you kind of have the, the resonance of the instrument. And sometimes I have with electronic music that you have to do a lot of thinking before you even have sound, or that there's a lot of technology involved. Um, I was wondering, how do you work in your relation between your, like your intuition and the technology that you use? Do you yeah. have like a specific workflow, or do you kind of? Yeah, I mean that's that's nice that you talk about that because I feel like um, there are certain things about making music which I really 
don't tend to like is, for example, the over-consumerism. It's a good moment to talk about that because we are all about to buy some more equipment. Um, and and, and uh, yeah, for me, for me, there was a good moment where I just really knew I could sell almost half of what I had. That was two years ago in the pandemic. I realized it's it's just all too much, and I, I found many things I didn't use for two years, and so I passed it on and sold all of it. Basically, everything I don't really need every day. And and um, the things I tend, and, and then I, I thought a lot about technology, because the process was, okay, what technology is really necessary? And I felt like an urge to be less dependent on electronics, because that is honestly the part I can't do repair myself. I can repair a squeaking piano pedal with a little bit of oil and, and do certain things mechanically much better than I can solder in an electronic box. And so I also thought a lot about like electricity, how much <laughs> consumption of everything everything is, and I have a million things on every day, but I just want to maybe play a little bit piano. And so I, I, I trust my intuition that um, if something sounds in that moment right to me, I, 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 I just don't want more. And, and so I started um, taking so much care, to, for example, how my piano sounds, that I have the right sound for that, that it really can play so many different roles in my musical life that I always like it. And so when I compare that experience, playing my piano and I have it on headphones and everything sounds great, and I worked for that, obviously, then I don't feel the need to get lost on a super complicated modular synthesizer where like basically only after one day I find one interesting thing. And, 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 and through that process I go through all like these other things which I don't really understand or like so much. And so I, I decided that in the end everything is sound to me. You know, there's a moving thing and happening in the speaker and nobody cares how complicated you thought about that sound if it just touches you it's great and and the last moment where i felt like oh my god i'm i need less is when i acquired glass harmonica which is obviously also was took took me years to get it and to to be able to afford it i sold uh, uh, Oberheim 4 voice and uh, Korg PS3100 and all these wonderful machines. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I sold all of that, which is incredible stuff. And, and, and then you can, you can spend whole weekends on it without recording anything. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and then I bought this wonderful mechanical instrument, just rotating glass balls, and you make your fingers wet and you play that. I took one microphone, put it through a reverb and a delay or something, and it sounded so better than any synthesizer in the world. You know? And I was able to play dynamically, so I was like enveloping the sound with my, I felt the vibration in my fingers, and then I felt like, okay, okay, I need more of that. You know, I, need, I just need really good sounding things, and I need a microphone, I need some, some mixing desk and do some effects, and, and it can be wood block, I pitch down, you know, like, sound is just sound it's just moving speaker and i always like also to mention matthew herbert uh, who back in the days um, played with a little 12-bit sampler and just one microphone made entire beats by smashing tvs on stage <laughs> and, and 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 that was very cool you know he didn't have any equipment you know and so yeah ideas 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 and just one or two good sounds you can rely on and and then more ideas mm -hmm. The, the whole dub thing started with one channel, two channels, three channels, four channels, and they were doing things which sound like hundred channels, you know. And so I feel like, uh, yeah, it's it's for me less technology is better. I don't use a modular at this point because I just want to make more a song, you know. I worry about the song and what the piece needs and 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 all that fiddling and all that research and all that scientific noodling. I wish I had time for that, but I, I, I get so impatient because I want to do the song. Um, but if you, for example, like the, the piece that you showed, you said that you kind of uh, adapted a, a MOOC for that? or uh, uh, The first you... five minutes was a MOOC. Uh -huh. uh, the MOOC was adapted with a sample and hold okay. on, on various inputs because it's my favorite modulation in the synthesizer world. Yeah, so sometimes you do think about uh, 
sound also before you start composing with it? Or exactly, it because because I'm, I'm dogmatic in one part, like a, a, when you play a recorder, like a block flute, you play that one note, we all agree it's a pretty boring tone. But uh, if, you, if you modulate that tone, for example, play the recorder and, and put it through some delays, like tape delays, which wobble and do certain things, and you get more modulation, like modulation which you cannot pro uh, um, predict. Predict, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Modulation <laughs> cannot predict, you know. Yeah, you knew, you knew. It's like it, because because that sign sign modulation or square modulation get very gets very old because it's so predictable, and and um, so I I know that when I have a sinus tone which comes very straight out of the um, a synthesizer or whatever, I know already that I'm looking for a lot of modulation. Mm. The more the merrier. Just tiny bits of different things. Um, to make it feel real, so it, it, it matches with my piano sound or with my other real instruments, mm. because if, if I don't bring them closer to the mechanical instrument sounds, like with complex modulation, um, there's, there's a place for like these straight out modulation things. I mean, so much music is shaped by that techno music and, and, and 80s music is really like going for the steady modulations and so it's a show off of that but I, I'm looking to turn the synthesizer into a piano and the piano to a synthesizer and then so in the middle everything beats so to say. Cool. Thank you. Ah, it gets so warm in here. Yes. <laughs> okay, <it's first>. Definitely. <laughs> Let's make maybe one more question and I play this other extremely long piece. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Boring question. Hello. Hi. So it seems that you enjoy playing still after some time, I would guess. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Uh, but it's also your job. So yeah. how do you make it to keep enjoying what you do, even though you do it professionally as a job? Oh, um, I don't need to do much for that because I just really, really enjoy that. Um, even though it's my profession, I never feel like. I learned something, even though I probably learned something. But um, it is, it is every same, every day the same. I, I, I need to do a song or work on something, or you know, and 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 I think of that first before I think about the financial aspects. The financial aspects play a role. They can be inspiring, of course. Like if you know, okay, you're broke and you need to do something. <laughs> it, it sometimes is really good motivation to get started, you know. But but I think if that would be the only driving force after a while, it would would be very sad, you know. And and it's it's good to have a team as well. So at the studio I have here in Funkhaus requires a little bit of structure. So there's a couple of people I work with every day, basically, and 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 seeing how much they love working together uh, inspires me also to like yeah. Uh, even though if I maybe wouldn't really feel like I need to play a concert personally, I know, okay, but we need to because otherwise they go work with somebody else, for example. You know? <laughs> and, and so it's, it's also good to think about that a little bit, you know, that you want to maybe keep everybody together for a longer period of time, not just for two years or just one record. And then with the next record, you have to look for other people. Uh, it's good to have a little bit of a plan how to space the events in your career out wisely so that you maybe don't need to burn so many people. And um, uh, I work basically with all my team for over 10 years already and, 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 and they started with me when I was getting 150 euros per show mm -hmm. and, 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 and so they're still there. So that's, that's a good sign and, and uh, I never wasted time on finding people and firing people basically. And, and that is also very uh, helpful for me to stay inspired because they're actually good friends and when I think of like okay I am a little bit tired of going to the studio today I think of all of that and that helps me. So it's more like an organism. Yeah it's an organism. <laughs> it needs to be it, it can't can't die. You know, I can't let it dry out like a plant. <laughs> like a plant completely dried out. I don't know. Yeah a little bit like that. Yeah. Maybe one more question and then we play it. Um, Let's assume you have just finished a track or something and you're done with something. How do you, what um, sparks? Okay. 
What sparks your next step of intuition? Do you start with an instrument or do you have something in mind? Let's say, I want to do something again with the piano and then you sit down at the piano and then you start noodling around. Or is it the new instrument that inspires you and then you, you start from there and you ask yourself, what do I add to this uh, instrument, to this layer of sound? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes honestly, you're just, you, it's, it's easy. When you've done a good track or you think you've done a good track, it will be harder to make the next track. And if you've done a really bad track, it will be quite easy to make the next track. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and whatever that means. Um, yeah, for me, it's like that. You know, like when, when I feel like, oh, that was such a good track, it's, it, it will be so hard to start a new one because you not always get lucky. Maybe the next one you start in the wrong key and something doesn't sound good, or you know, sometimes things fall into place. We all know it, and then, and then it's a little bit terrifying to start fresh. So, I don't really remember how I do it. Really, I just get through that process of the blank page, and mm -hmm. often, often I just sit in the studio and do nothing. Really, I mean, I try, but then I, I go home clearly knowing, oh wow. What a waste of time! <laughs> <laughs> but but I think but, but I think at, at least I was there, you know, ready. I was ready. <laughs> the the creativity wasn't ready or the music wasn't ready, but I was there. Like better better if you were there because when it happens, you're there. So I try to yeah, be there as much as can possible. Can I ask one question back to the desk and the, because you you say uh, the piano is so important for you yeah, as a, as a, as a source of let's say inspiration call it that but then the the desk is it playing a big role also in how you grab the the sound from the piano is it do you have special people working on that or do, do you figure it out yourself how do you do yeah the desk is absolutely gorgeous i love it to pieces but it is not it's not a wizard you know like when the piano sounds bad it will just record a really bad sound yeah. on the piano <laughs> and, and so that's a good sign for a good desk you know like when you have a shitty sounding instrument mm -hmm. even if you have a very good microphone and the best cable and what not it will just sound wrong yeah. and so i recommend uh, always go back to the root classically you know like uh, if the foundation is bad the bridge will collapse so the foundation for me is always the instrument itself uh, do you need to recap everything in a synthesizer? No, but the power supply, and, and you need to worry about a couple things and, and maybe measure some noises and then and, and do all of that. And so uh, tune the piano and get a maybe piano technician to help you make the piano sound good in the room. And if you feel like without everything it sounds good, then you start recording it. And then you usually get done very fast. You just put the microphones here or there, it sounds both fantastic. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, the next track is a little bit uh, peak of the show, so it's a little bit over the top.
cranked the speakers a little bit, so I didn't hear any distortion in the studio, but I got too excited here. We need more next time. <laughs> mm, <bigger> PA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is it called the butterfly effect? Uh, what do you mean? The song. Or the, the song, the, the bees, butterfly the effect. Bees. Yeah. It's like for me. As it's yeah. it's it's many notes. But, it's but I don't have to play them. It's just it's like, like all the butterfly <laughs> effect. It's like <laughs> expanding like cosmos. <laughs> yeah, it's super. It's not really fun to play it for you because it's not a song from an album. Everybody can hear. It. Uh, even better if you come to the concert next time, and because the visual I think is uh, is nice if you. If you see all that stuff being kind of used, and also things go wrong, and then you feel like, oh, come on, do it, and then it comes, and yes, and everybody says, <laughs> <laughs> do it. Perfect. 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 Perfect.